Lift Fit Podcast, episode 131, with the behavior change gurus, doctors Jan and Jim Prochaska. So often uh, people come to coaches that have tried numbers of times to you know, change uh, one or more important uh, behaviors, and they can end up being demoralized. And that's one of the major reasons why people are pre-contemplation. You know, the history says they want to change, but the demoralization can cause them to give up on their ability to change. And it really becomes one of the ways to counteract demoralization is to provide new alternatives, to provide more hope, and to provide things that says, oh, I could do that. Uh, We've also have seen that uh, when one of our uh, projects was involving uh, perpetrators of domestic violence and they first took their first session and said, wow, I'm in pre-contemplation. I only have four more stages to go. So it was seen as a hopeful thing that there is a way to get out of the situation that they're in and that there is a place to start. Welcome to the Live Fit Podcast with Glenn Johnson, your resource for all things that contribute to good health. You will hear expert advice and interviews with leading authorities on fitness, food, fat loss, mindset, and the mind-body connection. You will find show notes, articles, and health programs at livefitpodcast.com. Ah, yes. It is time once again for the Live Fit Podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Johnson, your guide to better health. Thank you, everybody, for listening. I am so excited because today's guests are the behavior change gurus, Dr. James Prochaska and his wife, Janice Prochaska. In 1977, Jim Prochaska, Carla De Clemente, and colleagues developed the trans theoretical model of behavior change. This was based on analysis and use of different theories of psychotherapy. And since that time, Jim has written three books and countless articles on the subject of behavior change. The trans theoretical model of behavior change, also known as simply the stages of change, has been the foundational model for coaches, trainers, counselors, and the like to help people change damaging behaviors into healthy behaviors. This is the model that people in the behavior change industry all use on a daily basis. And the interesting thing is you have all gone through these changes. You simply may not have known it at the time. You may have heard before of the stages of change I'm referring to by pre-contemplation. This means you're not ready. Contemplation, you're getting ready. Preparation, you are ready. Action, you are currently taking action. Maintenance. This is monitoring that stage, make sure you're staying the course. And termination, this is when it's done, it's set. You have that new behavior, it's not a problem. You're probably not going to relapse. If you're not a behavior change professional, why would you care about any of this? Well, because most people have at least one behavior they would like to change. And in this episode, the Prochaskas are going to share how you can use this behavior to live your life healthy, fit, and free. Good morning. I have Dr. Jan and Dr. Jim Prochaska on the line, and we are going to talk about the trans theoretical model or the stages of change and their latest book, Changing to Thrive. How are you two doing this morning? Doing well, thanks. Yes. Thank you. So... The, the title of your book caught my attention early on because I am a health coach with Kaiser Permanente, and as you are well aware, their main motto is thrive. And that is what brought me to Kaiser because they are very prevention-oriented, as am I. I'm not a big fan of abusing your body and then trying to fix it later. I think it's far easier and better and healthier to prevent situations and illnesses and diseases, et cetera, from happening before they ever do. It's that whole ounce of prevention each equals a pound of cure thing. So tell me, where did you get the title for this book? And we'll talk about more details later, but but where did that come from? Where did your idea for this book come from? Well, two, two uh, sources. One was uh, our classic book, uh, Changing for Good, uh, a takeoff on that. Uh, that's uh, 20 years old. It's a classic used by a lot of coaches and the public. Uh, 
And so we, it, it's not a sequel, but it really is an update on all the breakthroughs that have happened in the last 20 years. Uh, the other source is a, a large project that we did with uh, 4,000 people using health coaches uh, uh, on the telephone as uh, our best uh, practice. And uh, our goal was to change a couple of um, uh, major risk uh, behaviors. Uh, we did that. Our coaches even changed some things we didn't treat. But what was particularly rewarding was that the majority of the 4,000 people we were working with uh, were suffering or struggling, and only a minority were thriving. And that's very unusual in the United States, where almost always the majority of population is thriving. Well, the good news was we reduced the negative behaviors, and we helped uh, with our uh, coaches uh, uh, to be able to change uh, to a minority thriving, to a clear majority thriving. Uh, and so that, that's uh, the kind of message that we want to share with coaches and with the public because uh, uh, too many people are suffering or struggling uh, these days, and we can help them to be thriving. It sounds like you're saying that this stuff works. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of evidence, yes. Now, so the audience can know what this stuff is, and I, I told a few people that I was talking to you, and the ones that were not in my field, they looked at me and said, Who, who's that? Never heard of them, or never heard of it, meaning the stages of change. So can you really briefly go over what the stages of change is? Yes, it's, it's a model of... Uh changing uh, one's behaviors. Uh, it's uh, often called the stages of change. And what it does is it assesses what stage people are in, and then we take and match the, the kind of help that we provide to the individual's uh, stage. And uh, we, we've changed the paradigm where historically behavior change equals taking action. Uh, but that excludes the vast majority of people with uh, high-risk behaviors. Uh, and uh, our motto becomes, wherever you're at, we can work with that. And so first stage, pre-contemplation. Historically seen as unmotivated, resistant, non-compliant, uh, but we know that they want to change, but they're not intending to take action in the near future. And then we go to contemplation, here they uh, have uh, progressed the stage. Uh, their pros or benefits of changing have increased uh, substantially, but they're characterized by having deep doubt whether it's worth it or not. And uh, you know, when you have doubt about it, the rule of thumb tends to be uh, don't act. Uh, so we help them with uh, different strategies to move to preparation. Here they're ready to take. Uh, uh, immediate action. Uh, these are the folks that uh, still too often are the only ones that are served by uh, coaching and other kind of programs. Uh, and then uh, we help them to uh, progress and be prepared for taking action because that's the most demanding time where people have to work the hardest to keep from relapsing. After about six months, they progress into maintenance. Here they don't have to work as hard, but they do have to be prepared to deal with times of, of distress, where they're at their emotional and uh, psychological weakest. Our ideal goal is to have people uh, get determination, where they have uh, zero temptation to go back to smoking, for example, total confidence that they will continue to exercise regularly, uh, and they're home free. They don't have to work as hard. So that's a quick summary. I've known about the stages of change ever since I became a personal trainer 20 years ago, and I would use it to explain to my my clients how how things progress so they could better understand it and my my conception of how it can be used with the you know the general person is to kind of ease their mind that 
these difficulties they're going through in changing their behavior and how there's some backsliding and you know moving back and forth and holding steady is natural and normal and it's a process that you have to go through like this you know the stages of grief etc would you say that's a fair use of it or do you have a better recommendation i think it's really helpful to a client to understand that there is a process that they could go through and to also look at where they're at right at this moment and what you as a helper could do to get them to the next stage and what they as an individual could do to help themselves get to the next stage so that you can work together. Uh, we've also have seen that uh, when one of our uh, projects was involving uh, perpetrators of domestic violence and they first took their first session and said, wow, I'm in pre-contemplation. I only have four more stages to go. So it was seen as a hopeful thing that there is a way to get out of the situation that they're in and that there is a place to start. But in terms of what you were saying, Glenn, in terms of uh, so often uh, people come to coaches that have tried numbers of times to you know, change uh, one or more important uh, behaviors, and they can end up being demoralized. And that's one of the major reasons why people are pre-contemplation. You know, the history says they want to change, but the demoralization can cause them to give up on their ability to change. And it really becomes one of the ways to counteract demoralization is to provide new alternatives, to provide more hope, and to provide things that says, oh, I could do that, rather than pressuring them uh, to take immediate action where they know they would fail, uh, we say, hey, change really equals progress. And we're going to work together to help you start to change right away because it means progressing uh, from pre-contemplation to contemplation. Well, that's fantastic. And, and all this makes me wonder, how did you come up with this whole trans-theoretical model of the stages of change and, you know, put them into this these nomenclatures and kind of the, the whole process that people go through? Well, we originally were looking to take and integrate the uh, processes used across leading theories of counseling and psychotherapy, and uh, we, we interviewed uh, ordinary people uh, to talk with them about how often they use those processes uh, with quitting smoking. And they would say, well... Uh, let's say increasing the awareness coming from Freud, they use that early on, but not now. But then when it came to reinforcing from uh, Skinner, they would say, oh yeah, I still use that sometimes. And so these ordinary people taught us something that weren't in any of the 150 theories of counseling, coaching, uh, psychotherapy. They taught us about the stages of change. So you learned it from the patient's you were working with? No, this was actually a, a, a group of people that uh, we we actually had, there was an article in the paper about us, and they uh, volunteered for us to come out and, and talk with them about, how, you know, how did they uh, become successful with quitting smoking, and uh, growing up in a factory neighborhood, I, I uh, really knew about the wisdom of ordinary people. It's why I, I believe it's so, uh, stages are so important, because it comes from the experience of ordinary people, not from uh, professionals making something up. That's fascinating. How long did it take to put it all together? Well, um, since we learned about uh, stages, I mean, it really, we, we knew that was a missing link for integrating processes from leading theories of uh, counseling and behavior change. But to, to really develop the evidence and the knowledge of how people were applying different processes at different stages. Uh, there we were fortunate to get a, a nice uh, large grant, and there we followed a 1,000 people over two years. And boy, did they teach us a lot about what worked, what didn't, uh, what mistakes they were making, and uh, how they could get stuck and how we could help them get unstuck. That's fascinating. It it's it seems kind of nebulous looking at uh, all the research that you had been doing. At least in my mind, bringing myself back to what you must have been looking at, and and you must have seen some similarities between what people were going through and put a name to it. 
Uh, yes, yeah, certainly that's the case with uh, the stages. I mean, you know, they didn't talk in terms of stages. They talked in terms of what they had experienced. Right. And, you know, as clinicians listening with their third, our third ear, we heard them talking about something that we then labeled the uh, stages of change. This is all used in your books, and your most recent one is Changing to Thrive, and, and I've been reading this, and I, and I find it fantastic, and it was pretty eye-opening how you, I don't know, help people change a behavior, and it's, it's much, much more than just knowing whether you're in the contemplation phase stage or preparation stage. It's knowing what to do while you're there. Yes. yes, exactly. And and a, a, a lot of folks say they use the uh, trans theoretical model. What they use are the stages. And we think of the stages like a road map, okay? But we also huh. then need to help them to, to understand how they can progress from one stage to the next. I mean, for example, people in pre-contemplation, uh, we know across more than 50 different uh, health-related behaviors uh, that the the pros of changing must go up, and so we can interact with them. You know, let's say we're talking about uh, a, a sedentary person who really wants to exercise but has relapsed a number of times. Um, we can talk with them. Hey, let's let's get a list of what are the benefits that you're aware of that you could get from regular exercise. Typically, those in pre-contemplation would give five or six. We would then say. Well, let's see if you could take and double that or between now and the next time we talk. Uh, and sure enough, uh, they can. And then we can indicate, hey, you're progressing. But we also tell them, you know, this is the bargain basement of behaviors. Do you like bargains? This is a behavior for you. We know there are <laughs> well over, over 60 uh, uh, scientific benefits from regular exercise. And there's nothing you can do with your time that can give you as much benefits. So let's, let's uh, you know, start progressing. And their demoralization go away. Hey, I could double that. You know, I mean, we don't just tell them, but like in the book we share with them, and they can check which ones are really important for them, and they can use those to help motivate them to uh, keep moving ahead. What's, what's helpful in Changing to Thrive, there's this individualized chapters on different risk behaviors, and with the exercise one, it helps an individual move through the stages of change by doing particular exercises. Any thoughts on the person that says, yes, I know, I totally agree with you that I need to exercise, but I don't like to? What would you do with that? Well, I, I think um, we can be, one, looking to think as far as in the past, have there been things that they have done in terms of with exercising? Um, one of the things that we would do, like uh, in Rhode Island, uh, thousands of people at this time of the year will go down to the beach, and and uh, we would suggest, hey, that's a you know great place to maybe just start to do a little walking along the shore, and you can do some people watching. You can appreciate the you know the scenery and all, uh, and to make it so that it can be you know, more rewarding, and, and to already start to get m multiple benefits. Uh, and that's one of the things about, in terms of enhancing the pros, that we, we don't want people to be doing it just for their weight, just for their heart, just for their diabetes. We want them to be affirming so much of their body and themselves. So we'll say, that, you know, let's make a list, you know. This week, I'm walking for my heart. Next week, I'm walking for my weight. The following week, I'm walking for my moods. Then I'm walking for my self-esteem. I'm walking for my energy. Uh, pretty soon, I'm running. So you help them find the, and use the many reasons that they are doing something. Even if they don't like walking, they can accept and actually go out and do some walking because they, they know and believe that it's good for their heart. Yes, but, but uh, you know, we don't just emphasize walking from my heart, walking from my That's what specialists do. That's what too many medical people do. Again, they may not like walking, but they are likely to like uh, not being so stressed, not being depressed, having more energy, feeling better about myself, others feeling better about me. Uh, and so we're helping them to find things they do like to do, and walking can be a way to, to accomplish those things. 
Now, I was reading about, in, I was reading in your pre contemplation section in your book, Changing to Thrive, and you say that people, there's the, the three D's of uh, what I guess keeps people from moving forward, and that's don't know how, demoralized, and defending. My question is, why did you stick that in the pre contemplation phase where somebody's not yet thinking about making these changes? and not part of contemplation. Okay. Um, I, I think the, the, the title sometimes can be misinterpreted. Pre-contemplation doesn't mean they're not thinking about it. It means that they're not intending to. We know people, um, I mean, here's an example. Uh, 80% of smokers are not uh, ready to quit, but 80% want to quit. Um, and so... Uh, we know that they can be demoralized because they have tried. But then what do you attribute your, your uh, failure to? If you attribute it to, I don't have enough willpower, well, that's going to demoralize you because what are you going to do about your willpower? Well, I don't have uh, the right kind of personality. So um, we, we need to make it clear, you know, particularly for coaches, that pre-contemplation means I don't, I'm not intending to take action in the immediate future. It's often misunderstood to mean I don't want to or I'm not thinking about it. Um, it sounds a lot like ambivalence. Well, ambivalence is really what's characteristic of uh, contemplation. There, the pros and cons are absolutely tied, and that, that was uh, true in a in a study of uh, 48 different behaviors and 125 studies, the pros and cons are absolutely tied. I mean, you want a measure of deep ambivalence, there it is. And in contemplation, the rule is, when in doubt, don't act. And so that deep doubt leads to delay. Someday I'll do it, but I'm going to put it off for now. If I was a smoker and I was happy smoking, I liked smoking, and I have, have, of course, heard that it's bad for my health, yet I'm not seeing any signs of that yet. Would that be in any stage? That, so that's not pre-contemplation. That's more pre-pre-contemplation? No, people, people can be in pre-contemplation who, um, who are enjoying their behavior or getting benefits from their behavior. I mean, they wouldn't be doing it if they weren't getting some benefits from it. Um, right. But if they have the awareness in terms of the kind of impact that smoking uh, can be having and really having, you know, right now, uh, but they also really don't have an adequate awareness at all of the multiple be benefits of quitting smoking that come from that. So, but that can also be, be part of the defensiveness. And, and one of the things that sensitive coach has to be aware of, you have somebody who is in pre-contemplation, they're expecting that the coach is going to try to push them to action. And so that can set their defenses off. And, uh, and one of those defenses can be denial that there's uh, you know, really uh, incredibly high risk from smoking. I mean, there's just nothing that compares uh, to that. And, and it, it can be affecting people's functioning right now, uh, like, uh, you know, in, in terms of their, their energy and, and all. But one of the things is, you know, we understand where they're at. We say, let's talk about and understand, have you tried in the past? The vast majority have. That says they want to. So right mm -hmm. now I might be enjoying it, but my history says I want to, and we can help them to want to even more. Tell us about the principles of progress. Well, um, we've already been talking about a couple of those. The, the, uh, like the first principle um, would be in terms of with people in pre-contemplation to increase their awareness, their appreciation of the benefits of changing, and then they can draw on those as uh, increasing motivation over time. Uh, once they get into contemplation with a pros and well, let me just step back. Um, other principles in pre-contemplation. One is since they don't know how, we want to uh, increase their awareness of how you uh, 
uh, break out of a stage of like pre-contemplation and, and what you can do. And, and one of the things is um, learning more about the model. Um, and so there are different principles at different stages. Um, I mean, here's an example of 30 seconds uh, mass media campaign in Los Angeles. Today it would have been like a $100 million campaign. Uh, I was a consultant on that. Here's 30-second spot. Man, clearly in grief, saying, I always worried that my smoking would cause an early death. I always feared that my smoking would cause lung cancer, but I never imagined it would happen to my wife. And then on the screen, 50,000 deaths a year due to passive smoking. So here you have social marketers using our model, 30 seconds, and the evidence, and it was targeted towards people in pre-contemplation, three processes, increase in awareness, 50,000 deaths, um, dramatic relief, raising the emotion, and then uh, being able to reduce it, like fear, like worry, uh, and then uh, what we call environmental reevaluation, how my changing can affect others and benefit others. So, you know, coaches, we have a lot more time, but mass media people show that this impacted on uh, people in pre-contemplation in uh, Southern California. You are listening to the Live Fit Podcast with behavior change gurus, Drs. Jan and Jim Prochaska, who are telling us how we can change our bad behaviors to good ones. You will see show notes, videos, articles, and health improvement plans on livefitpodcast.com. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Enjoy the rest of the show. Well, one of the uh, lines I picked out of your book is the first thing that needs to change is the mind. And I wholeheartedly agree. And I, you know, use a similar line pretty much every day with somebody. Yet, if that is true, let's say you have a loved one. Um, I'm just going to make up a scenario. So let's say my mom smokes and I want her to quit smoking, but she doesn't want to because she really enjoys it. Is there anything I can do to help her change her mind and to move her towards change and becoming a non-smoker? Well, what, what really the, the most important uh, change that can happen uh, with coach and client, and can happen for coaches, is when we talk about change in our mind, first and foremost, it's our mental model of what behavior change means. Because most Americans have uh, the naive model that behavior change equals taking action. And instead, our model is behavior change equals progress. And so, Mom, I don't want you to take and quit smoking. I'd just like you to help you to appreciate in terms of... Uh, you know, what the benefits might be if you ever uh, decide that you might want to. Um, and so, but I want you to, to understand that your action model can get in the way for other changes as well. And a, behavior, a stage model really frees you up to be doing things that are not very demanding, that uh, can be beneficial uh, to helping you move. So with coaches, do you have a mental model of action or do you have a mental model of progress equaling change? And that is your, your first principle is increase your pros. So that goes along the lines of, of helping them find their pros. And your second principle of progress is increase your consciousness. Once again, is that something that you can do with somebody else? And is that, is that part of what you were just explaining or is this a, a different uh, kind of branch? Well, again, the, the increase in changing consciousness to me is this is a place where it's helping people to change their mind, their mental model. And that mental model is, I mean, keep in mind that 80% of people with most of the major risk uh, behaviors uh, are not uh, prepared to take action and they don't think they're going to be prepared for, until maybe a crisis hits or whatever. Um, but once they get, a, a, you know, start to change their mental model, 
then they can say, hey, I can do that, and that's not something that I feel pressured about having to do. It's not what so many people are telling me. You have to exercise. You have to lose weight. You have to quit smoking. Uh, that just makes me defensive or demoralized. Whereas, how about just thinking about it? How about just increasing awareness of what it would be like to make some changes? But partly, too, the mental model that we are talking about changing is also the coach's mental model. Yeah, absolutely. That, that change doesn't equal action. Change means going through the stages of change. Right, right. Can you give an example of that? Well, um, I mean, I, I'll, I'll give you an example where th there's a free quit line that people can call and can talk to a coach on the phone, and the coach takes and assesses uh, what states they're in, and uh, the person's uh, in pre-contemplation, and the, the uh, coach is spending 45 minutes trying to get them to set a quit date in the next 30 days, that is to have them leap to uh, pre-contemplation, and at the end of the 45 minutes, the person's not uh, prepared to do that, and the coach says, well, call me back when you're ready. I mean, that's just totally irresponsible. 45 minutes, and I could tell you about a study we, we you know, worked with with the Air Force, where 45 minutes got four to five times more people in pre-contemplation to end up being quit 12 months later. So, I mean, here it is, you know, a, a program with uh, so much lost opportunity that way. And your study in the Air Force, were you able to be more successful by simply asking them to think about it? Uh, the the um, what happened was um, I, I was a consultant on this, and I helped them to assess what stage people were in. But uh, the 45 minutes were spent on discussing the benefits of staying quit. Uh, in the Air Force, they had to be quit for six weeks, um, and uh, th there were random urine draws. If there was any evidence that they were smoking during the six weeks of basic training, the consequence was they had to recruit, re repeat the basic training. No smoking, okay? Ouch. No smoking. But 12 months later, what was the recidivism rate? You know, we ask audiences that, including professionals. They'll guess, they, you know, they know it's high from what I'm asking. They'll say 80% higher, 90% higher, 100% it's got to be. No, higher, 123%. What does that mean? 23% more of the enlisted people were smoking 12 months later than when they joined up. And we concluded the Air Force was a major risk factor for the enlisted people's health. But 45 minutes of talking about um, the uh, benefits of staying quit, four to five times more enlisted people were quit at 12 months. So, I mean, the magic of one principle uh, hmm. you know, being there is, is just uh, you know, amazing. And here's a national quit line, or at least some states quit lines. 45 minutes available. They try to pressure them to, to set a quit date, and they could have been talking with them, interacting around the benefits, and have a big impact with that 45 minutes. So it sounds like you're saying these quit lines, are, or the people at the quit lines who work there, aren't uh, very well trained. Ah, uh, yes. Well, they're, they're trained in a wrong model. They're trained in the action model that I've got to get this person to commit to quit, and that's my job, and I need to do it. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it is you know, just a striking example of how our mental model can get in our way and can cause us to you know, just you know, waste time and waste money and waste the, uh, the opportunity because only change that counts is taking action. And, and it sounds like half of this is the person working with the other person that they have the right mental space. In other words, that if I was working with somebody to help them uh, make up their mind that they wanted to quit smoking, I would first have to make up my mind to meet them where they are, yeah. not try to get them to meet me where I am. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and to make up your mind that just helping them to increase their pros is already starting the change process. And helping them to progress one stage doubles the chances they'll take effective action in the near future. In an action model, 
you're failing because they haven't taken immediate action. And so it affects, you know, how we feel about our, ourselves as professionals uh, versus how we can feel empowered that uh, the smaller steps of, of uh, increasing a principal at the pros or progressing one stage really counts. And we need to share that with our clients. So that helps them to also feel good about the progress they're making. And it goes back to your motto, wherever you're at, we can work with that. Yeah, absolutely. And let me just say, if there are coaches out there who aren't reaching enough people, one of the things that, that they can do is to let people know, and we often use the uh, um, traffic light as a symbol, red light, not ready, green, yellow light, getting ready, green light, ready, ready or not, yeah, I like that. Call, we can be of help. Is your... I don't know your philosophy or your 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 method. Is it only for coaches or people to help somebody else, or can somebody use it on themselves? Well, the good news is, that, yeah, definitely, because we we really started with people who had discovered how to take and uh, be successful with like quitting smoking, the hardest behavior to change, uh, and yes, they can, but changing to thrive really is is a guide that can help them to maximize their efforts and to to be, you know, most people when they go to change, it's like trial and error. I'll try this and make an error, and I'll try that and make an error. I may find something that works, or I may demoralize myself. Guided learning, we know, have known since I was a student, uh, that guided learning way outperforms trial and error. And what Changing to Thrive provides is guided learning for both coach and client. We've been using smoking as an example, and I do work with people who want to quit smoking, but probably my biggest bread and butter is people who want to lose weight. How can this book be used for somebody like that? If uh, you know somebody listening has tried every diet ever conceived and they still can't manage their weight or bring it down to where they want, can they read your book and follow it and get to a place where they have lost uh, a good amount of weight and maybe reach their goal? Yes, and, and, and I'm glad you've raised that, Glenn, because, uh, you know, millions of Americans have tried to lose too many t- weight too many times in too many ways, and they really get demoralized about it. And partly one of the things that, that our book does when we talk about weight is to help them understand what do they attribute their failure to. If they attribute it to not having enough willpower, that's going to demoralize them. If they attribute it to uh, having, not having the right genes, that's going to demoralize them. If they can attribute it to you know, not understanding how the process works and understanding that it is a multiple behavior change process, it's uh, uh, eating and uh, exercising, um, then you know, they, they can start to, to prepare themselves and again, one of the things with, with so many people with uh, efforts to lose weight, you know, I've tried everything, nothing works, and I give up on myself. And what we say to people, look, the only mistake you can make is to give up on your ability to change. And we're not going to give up on your ability to change. But yes, we, de- we devote uh, um, a whole chapter to healthy weight loss uh, and... and uh, but we said it separated into healthy eating and exercising regularly. Right, because we also don't want them to be making those changes just for weight, right? Because we want them I also, agree. right? We want them to be doing it because, I mean, we look at in terms of, in, in our program, what's the most common predictors or the best predictors of losing weight? One is I'll have uh, more respect for myself. Another is uh, I will have more energy. Another is uh, others will be uh, uh, feeling better about me. Um, and, and, and the list goes on. And uh, again, like not walking from my weight, walking from my weight, walking from my weight, you know, walking from my self-esteem, walking from my energy, walking from my sleep, walking from my... Uh, moods, walking from my stress. You know, when I'm doing those kind of things, weight loss is going to be uh, become easier because um, these are immediate thing, benefits that I can start to get from 
um, they can change this both in eating and in exercise. So many people try to have their foot on both sides. They, they'll go on a diet because they want to lose weight, and then when they lose some, they feel victorious and they, they return to their old habits. And this is because they simply didn't make up their mind on how to live their lives. So their, their weight is a, is a product of that. Is there, this, would your book help somebody move from that type of mentality to changing the mind to you know, treat the body with respect? Well, I, I think in terms of, um, you know, what we were just talking about in terms of to appreciate uh, just how much uh, they can enhance their health and well-being, you know, with, you know, again, the example, you know, eating for my heart, eating for my weight, eating for my uh, moods, eating for my sleep, um, that it is, you know, changing my, my uh, uh, life in multiple ways. I'm going to have your uh, principles of progress on my show notes page. I, it's you know there's there's twelve of these principles, and I don't want to uh, go through each one of them here with you right now. But I will have them listed, and of course they're in your book. So I, I highly recommend people read your book. But can you give us an overview of the principles of progress so we can get an idea of what this actually is, besides what the name implies? Well, we have. We have talked about some of those. In the early stages, uh, we talk about the uh, um, principles and processes being more cognitive and affective, that is, more thinking and feeling. Uh, in the later stages, it's more uh, overt kinds of uh, behaviors, um, like you know, substituting uh, healthy food for an unhealthy one, uh, substituting, you know, walking as a way to reduce stress to flopping on the couch and watching TV. Uh, so uh, there are um, emphasis more on thinking and feeling in the early stages. And part of it, what is good about that is, is that those are easier to do. And those are things that you're not likely to feel like you're going to fail at. And those are things that can you can build on over time. So when you go to take action, you're much more prepared for it and you have much more motivation because you're affirming so much of your body, your mind, yourself, and your relationships. But, and as Jim was saying, in the later stages of preparation and action, you're going to do things that are more behavioral, like the substitution, like setting up your environment so it's easier to do the new healthier behavior like having gym shoes in your car or at work so that you could put them on and take a walk. Um, also getting people to help you do the healthier behavior by getting buddies that would share some of the exercise with you, for example, or go out and have a healthy lunch as an alternative. Yeah, I mean, just as an example, uh, Jan and I had to take off of our shopping list the uh, potato chips and ice cream, and <laughs> <laughs> because you know it's it's like uh, you know alcoholic. If I got alcohol in the house, you know I'm going to be much much more tempted to turn to that when I'm feeling distressed. If I've got potato chips and ice cream in the house, I'm much more likely to turn to that for comfort. Uh, Absolutely. You know. you know, it sounds like what you're saying is what I what I call skill power putting things in in place to be successful. Carrying your gym shoes in your car is a great example of skill power rather than the willpower of driving home from work to get your gym clothes and then leave and go back to the gym. That takes an incredible amount of strength and willpower to not just stay at home and flop on the couch. So I, I, love, I love where you're going with this. And I have just one more question. So many people tell me that they have this notion, they heard, somebody told them, whatever, that it takes... X number of days for a behavior change. 21 is the most common. I don't know where this came from. I think you even said the same thing in your book. Where did this come from? But tell me, how long does it take for behavior change to be complete? Well, uh, complete is one thing. But yes, 21 days is what's been used. And we think it comes from our research on uh, 
New Year's resolutions where 50% of people have relapsed uh, within 21 days. And the media, I think, misinterpret that to mean that everybody yes. else is home free. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> the relapse continues well after uh, 21 days. It, it really doesn't level off until about six months. Um, and so that's why we, we say to folks, you know, you need to think of action as like the equivalent of life-saving surgery. If you're going through life-saving surgery, but you tell others that you're going to need more support, that you're not going to be at your best, that you're... Uh, not going to be uh, able to, not going to function as well. But after six months, then uh, you really are not having to make nearly as much efforts. Um, and when you move into maintenance after six months, then what you have to be prepared for are times of distress. Because we know that average Americans, when we get distressed, we smoke more cigarettes, drink more alcohol, eat more junk food, flop on the couch more. And so what's my plan uh, for distress? Because it's going to happen. That we don't have control over. And, um, and so uh, when we get distressed, if we've got that plan, we can turn to healthy alternatives. Then we're much more on our way to being uh, uh, really free from the, the... The efforts are much, much less and only occur when, when there are times of distress. And I just want to add, I really like your concept of the skill power to offset willpower. That's, that's really clever. Yeah, I like that, too. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, Jan and Jim Prochaska, I really appreciate you taking the time to be on my show. This is fascinating. I love your book. I think anybody who helps people change and who may have a behavior they want to change should read this book. I found it very, well... What do I say? Readable, and and you mentioned that you grew up with blue collar workers, and you know the regular regular folks that run this country that that uh, we we see every day, and I think this book definitely is is written for any level of of reading. You don't have to be a scientist or a psychologist to understand what's the the principles and use these principles of this book. Well, listen. Appreciate very much the opportunity to, to uh, share with your audience and appreciate what, you, what you're sharing with the audience about our book. And uh, if, if you choose, we could have a follow-up sometime in terms of, you know, I, our goal is typically uh, to help people progress one stage. And, and if there are folks who still have an action model, if we help them progress to start thinking about uh, a stage mental model, uh, this time has been a success for them as well. That's terrific. How can people get a hold of you? Oh, I was saying that... that uh, you, you know, you, you can share our email, my email, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. It, do you have a website that people can learn more about you and your, yes, your book? Yes, we do. www.jprochaska.com all yeah. right, jpetraska.com. I am going to have that on my show notes page with a lot of other information. And uh, who's the J in this J Petraska? Uh, all four <laughs> of the all four of the Prochaskas. <laughs> <laughs> Janice, James, uh, Jason, and Jody. <laughs>